The Plan, written by Jack Wright. School, Fairlock Elementary School. Fourth grade for now, but will be in fifth. Characters, Cindy. Really smart, nice with blonde hair, and she wears a t-shirt and skirt. Mm -hmm. Maybell, not that good at science. Dark hair in a bun, she looks similar to Sydney. Dr. Rowe, he's very talented, but kind of clumsy. Can make good inventions, but he's crazy at the same time. He used to be friends with Maybell's dad. They got into a big fight and Maybell's dad threw him against a rack of potions. Acid fell on his eye and he has a scar from the broken glass. Robo. <laughs> Front desk. Scene one. 12 p.m., 4th of July, 2025. At Cindy's apartment. It's kind of small, but looks like a normal apartment on the outside. Shiny on the inside. Sydney is sitting down on her chair reading a book. There's a knock at the door. She gets up and looks through the peephole. <gasps> what you doing here? You want to go outside and take a walk? I'm busy. You want to come inside? Sure. <clears throat> so I was looking at um, on my phone and I saw that the scientists had discovered this brand new type of bird called the Lacradoo. Do you want to see what it looks like? Okay. <laughs> Maybell's alarm goes off. Oh no! I'm late! Oh, I'm so sorry, but I have to go. I, I, I forgot that I work today. It's okay. I mean, it happens to me all the time. I'm, I'm not even mad. Maybell leaves the apartment. Well, I guess I should get back to writing this book on the Lacradoo. Scene two. Same time as scene one. Dr. Rowe's apartment is full of parts and other inventions he's made scattered around the room. The walls are kind of ripped. There's a big black and white painting of Dr. Rowe's dad dressed in a tuxedo. Some of the paint is coming off of it. You see the shadow of Dr. Rowe and, and we hear zapping noises. <laughs> And done. Dr. O pulls back the curtain and pulls out a ginormous missile the size of a kid. Now, just to put it in place, Robo. Looks down and sees Robo right in front of him. Take this and put it in my don't enter zone. Make sure you don't break it. He tries. He sits down on a chair with an old computer. Now I gotta look up 4th of July, 2025 locations where they're setting off fireworks. He tries to find his favorite location near him and presses the enter button. Aha, bingo. Now all I gotta do is fire the missile at the citizens and oh, rule the world, yeah! <laughs> Scene three, 2 p.m., 2025, July 4th, Sydney's house. Sydney is at her desk in her house writing about the lacrydoo. There's a vibration from the phone in her pocket. Pulls the phone from her pocket. Hey, hey, I have a text from Maybell. Time to read it. <clears throat> there is an old warehouse far out of the city. Should I go in? Why not go in? I don't think anyone lives there. I guess I should get back to writing this book. Cuts to Maybell walking in front of the warehouse. Hello? Anyone there? 
Mabel looks around the building and it's all torn up and looks down to see a small robot. <laughs> Here's footsteps coming down the stairs towards her. No! Oh. Over on its back, still trying to open the door, sees a figure step from the dark stairs. <laughs> I know you. You're, you're Dr. Rowe, the, the crazy scientist. Crazy? I'm not crazy, I'm psycho! <laughs> okay, I'm not, but I'm still crazy a little bit. Mabel reaches for her phone, but Robo takes it. <laughs> and gives it to Dr. Rowe to break it. Robo grabs Mabel. Let me go. Don't, don't do this. Robo, tie her up by the hands. Bring me my shrink ray. I used to be friends with your dad at Maximum Corp. Tell me how to get in without being seen. I, I don't know how to get in. Wrong choice. Fires the shrink ray and shrinks Maybell. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Oh. <laughs> he tries to step on her. Still need to know how to get in. Now, with Maybell out of the picture, I can finally put my weapons to use! Yeah! <laughs> Robo, bring me my missile. No? Now we can rule the world! Gets on the table and starts dancing. Now all I gotta do is go to maximum core and take the elevator to the very top. Once I'm there, I'll play my missile and wait. Robo starts dancing. There's a disco ball. <laughs> Alright! <laughs> When it's time, I pull out my remote and this a big red button. Oh, oh yeah. He had a random remote in his hand and pushed the button. Robo, where did that button go to? Robo points to a laser gun. Uh oh. The laser shoots and he falls off the desk and lands on top of him. Then I can have control over the world. Yeah. Scene four, 4 p.m. Sydney's house at her desk. Sydney is sitting at her desk writing a book. I am done for now. I haven't heard from Maybell in a long time. Maybe I should check on her. R period U period okay? Question mark? An hour passes by. <laughs> Are you the Napa dude? <laughs> And then the friends. <laughs> mm. 
Now I'm getting worried. I should go check on her. She grabs her backpack, a baseball bat, a notebook, a camera, a brand new pen and ink cartridge. She forgets her phone. She leaves out the front door. Twenty minutes later, she's at the front of the warehouse. Cindy breathes in and out. She pulls scared. She pulls out her baseball bat. Let's do this. Scene 5, 5.25 p.m. Dr. Rowe's evil lair, but she doesn't know he lives there. Cindy's inside the building looking around. She hears zapping noises. <laughs> she looks down and rubbles right in front of her. <laughs> he hits him in the head and Rubble falls down the stairs. <laughs> she sprints down the stairs. She sees all these inventions. She's in Dr. Rose's do not enter room. She looks around to see if Maybell's there. She falls backwards into a chair and metal things clamp around her wrist. Dr. Rowe is right behind her. Are you friends with that Maybell girl? Were you too late? She's dead! <laughs> Cindy sees a ginormous machine that's metal. There's a power button. She gets a bobby pin by throwing it into her hand. She throws it and hits the power button. The machine makes a powering up noise. What's that sound? Did you turn on the magnet machine? His desk starts sliding towards him. Can you stop that from coming towards us? Oh yeah, sure I can. Wait, what? He hits the machine and it explodes. The bobby pin flies back into her hand because she's a lucky duck. She unpicks the locks and runs towards the stairs. Wait, I forgot to tell you about me. Uh, never mind. Cindy runs up the stairs and out of the building. She hears a whispering in her ear. talking about his plans. He said something about going to the top of Maximum Corp and setting off a missile. How do we unshrink you? We'll figure that out at Maximum Corp. Ha! Scene 6, 6.56 p.m. Lower level of Maximum Corp. Sydney goes to the elevator and presses the 120th floor, which is the top level. They get out of the elevator and see a door by the windows and run toward it. Do you think that there will be any shrink, unshrink breeze up here? The inventions are for the environment, not shrink rays and stuff. They see a ladder and climb up, then push the door to get outside. They see Dr. Rowe right there. Well, well, well. What have we here? Girl! 
Dr. O grabs Maybell off of Cindy's shoulder. He grabs Maybell by the arm and dangles her over the edge. I'll drop her. You wouldn't dare. Shrugs and let's go of Maybell. <gasps> <laughs> this is all my fault. I don't know how this is your fault, but I'm just gonna say it's your fault because I got stuff to do. The missile and starts climbing up the pole. He uses his feet to hold on to the pole and pulls out a rope from his pocket. He places the missile on top of the pole and ties the rope around it. He slides down the pole. Now to wait. He pushes a button on his watch and smoke comes out of his sleeve and makes Cindy and Dr. Rowe fall asleep. Cindy wakes up with bleary vision. She sees Dr. Rowe looking out over the city. She looks down at her watch and it's 7.59 p.m. She starts walking towards Dr. Rowe and is about to push him off. And Dr. Rowe moves out of the way and she accidentally falls off. She screams. <laughs> she grabs onto the edge of the building. I knew this would happen. <laughs> he stomps on her fingers and she lets go. She starts falling and Dr. Rowe walks back to the pole. Sydney is falling, covers her eyes, and is about to hit the ground, but she starts floating. She looks up and sees a lacquer deer. Got you! Ha ha! While I was falling, I landed on something and I looked down and I was on the lacquer Ha ha! The lacquer didn't know I was on her, and so it took me back to its nest. When I got back to the nest, I started talking to the lacquer and um, told her how I needed to go back to the city. After a couple of hours, the lacquer let me get on it, and we came back to the city. Then I saw you falling, so I told the lacquer to go down and catch you from falling. Ha ha! Thank you. Drop us right here, Lacradoo. Go, 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 go. The Lacradoo drops him off at the very top of the building. <sighs> Goodbye, Lacradoo. Goodbye, Lacradoo. The Lacradoo flies away. You go deal with Dr. Rowe, I'll go stop the missile, ha ha! Mabel runs to the pole. Dr. Rowe tries to punch Sydney. He misses and she starts fighting back. They're rolling around on the ground. It cuts to Mabel trying to cut the rope. It cuts back to Cindy and Dr. Rowe fighting. It goes back and forth for a while. Cindy falls off the building, holding onto the ledge. This is the end. It cuts to Mabel untying the rope. The missile starts falling in slow motion. No! In slow motion, he starts trying to punch Sydney. But he gets hit in the back and falls off the building. Sydney pulls herself onto the building and sees the locker room. As Dr. Rowe is falling, the fireworks start going off. One of the fireworks catches Dr. Rowe's coat. Ah! The firework explodes. Now I just need to get back on the building. Cindy gets back on the building. Cindy pulls the camera and takes a photo of the lacquer. 
The lacquerdu flies away. Cindy puts her hand on the ground for Mabel to climb back onto her shoulder. They go back to the elevator and go back down to the bottom level. She goes to the front desk. Um, <clears throat> do you have any iron shrink rays? Oh, yeah. He pulls out a shrink ray. What do you need it for? For... Oh, yeah. He points this at her shoulder. He shoots at her shoulder. Oh, wait, wait, wait! They both get bigger and bigger and they both fall on each other. <laughs> Thank you! You want to go back to my house? Sure. Mm -hmm. Scene 7, 9.30 p.m. Sydney's house. Sydney's grabbing a photo from her printer. It's the photo of the lacquerdu, and she puts it in her book about lacquerdus. So, you play a game? Sure! <laughs> Puts to build grass with a big hole in the ground. A hand comes out of the hole. Dr. O gets out of the hole and gets up. No one treats me like that. Robo, come here. Oh, wait. He's not here. I got a trick up my sleeve for next year. <laughs> the end? And start recording now, um, just so you can. Uh, we can have this for, as part of the the show that we're going to show everybody. Okay. How's it going? Good. Good. Did you just watch your show? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and how was it? It was good. Yeah. Was it like you expected it would be when you wrote it? Not really, but yeah. I mean, I liked it. Good. I'm glad to hear that. You know, we had a lot of fun uh, working on it, as you can imagine. Yeah. Did it look like we had fun? Uh, yeah. Have you ever seen a Music Fire Project show before? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you wrote one? Uh, yeah. I've seen, I've seen some before. Okay. And did you want to join the Music Fire Project when you saw it? Not really. Okay. So your parents just signed you up or your dad just signed you up? Well, well, he convinced me, then I wanted to do it. Okay, cool. Or like, he sent me into it, but then I started liking it. Nice. That's cool. That's good to hear. Um, so thinking back, like, do you remember the good old days when you were in the library? That was a long time ago. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah? Yeah. So what were some of the things that you remember that you guys did with like Miss Evie and some of the people who were there? Um, we did a thing we introduced ourselves by like doing like these um like like kind of like I don't know like kind of like dance moves or something like we introduced ourselves by like moving or something like by doing either like a um kind of like a boom like that yeah. and then like people have to go back over and like say our names and like do the move we did. What was writing a play like for you? I mean, it was different. Different from what? Because um, it was different. It was because it was like um, I used to like I like did a bunch of like stories, but like that had like like stage directions, and it was just different and stuff. 
and like there was some different stuffs about it. Mm -hmm. Then what was the hardest thing about it? You think? Um, saying like who said what? Because it's kind of hard because you have to keep writing like Sydney and like Maybell over and over again, and saying like what they say because there's a bunch of like conversations and it's just hard. What was the what was the the best thing about your whole experience of the Music Fire project? I don't know. It was basically all of it. I liked it all. That's good to hear. Is there any one particular thing that sticks out? Um, not really. Okay. I just like a bunch of the, I just like it. If you were going to tell anybody else about the Music Fire project, what would you say? It's fun and it's also kind of educational on like how to write like stories like if people like ever grow up and start like writing like if they make plays they have to like write it out and it could be helpful later and it could help like them later i don't know that's basically all yeah so when you watched your play it was a little different than what you expected in your head right yeah what were some of the things that were different in your mind versus what you saw in the play well, I don't know. It's just like, um, I, it was actually not that much. I like, I basically thought of all the things they did. Oh yeah. Okay. Basically everything they did, I imagined. Was there anything unexpected about it to you? Uh, not really. There's only like one scene that was like, um, where like, it's, where I say like an hour passes, mm -hmm. but like when they did the, like when they said the hour passes, it like showed, um, I think Sydney like playing with like her toys and like doing instruments. And then like, it eventually goes back to like the story I wrote. Exactly, yeah. I mean, they basically did like everything like, like fine. Does it, does it make you want to write more? Or do you think you want to write more plays or screenplays well, or do any of that more of that kind of stuff? I was thinking if like, if I did, um, if I did it on like next year, cause I was actually kind of wanted to do it next year because I kind of liked it. And I kind of wanted, like, I was actually planning to kill Dr. Rowe or, like, when the explosion happened. I was, I was expecting him to die, or I was going to, but then I wanted to do it again, so I started making it, like, um, where there will be a second part to it. So I was thinking, like, next year I could do, like, a part two to that story. That's awesome. So you, you want to continue your own story that you've, you've made so far. Yeah, I want to continue that. That's very cool. Is there anybody you want to say thanks to or anything like that and dedicate your show to? Not really. It's mostly the actors. Mostly, like, I like all the actors, and that's basically, like, I don't know. I just, basically everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and work with us and for your writing and for, you know, letting us, like, have so much fun making your story come to life in this way. So, no, you know, this was, you're the, this is the first time we've ever done anything like this with the Music yeah. Fire Project. So you're kind of part of an experimental group and we thank you for, you know, going for it with us. Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, I hope to see you real soon. So stay safe. Okay. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye.